So today our lecture is from Neil Forrest. Neil Forrest has had a lifelong passion for engineering. Following his graduation from a mechanical engineering degree at Aberdeen University and a craft apprenticeship with John Wood Group, Neil had a very successful 34 year career in Rolls-Royce PLC with 25 years in a number of senior leadership roles. Most of his time at Rolls-Royce was spent on product development and the establishment of experimental capabilities that were an essential route to the market. These ranged from measurement capability through data acquisition and management strategies to the provision of major unique capital projects such as the Ultrafan Gearbox test facility. Neil's career within Rolls-Royce resulted in his final role as company senior fellow for verification, test and measurement. There are only around 10 senior fellows in the company at any one time and the senior fellow role is the pinnacle of technical achievement. As a senior fellow, Neil provided company-wide leadership, capability and workforce planning and ownership of key processes related to verification, test and measurement. He also chaired and co-chaired two different industry advisory committees and had a three-year position as visiting professor of aerospace strategy at Sheffield University. Neil recently left Rolls-Royce to seek some new and exciting challenges. He now runs his own consultancy, and for Consultancy Limited, as a results orientated executive le level leader, engineering professional with a proven track record in strategic business development, major capital project delivery from concept to operational handover, product VNV, and engineering operations leadership. Neil is a chartered engineer and fellow of the Arnicky. And then over to Neil, I hope you enjoy the lecture. As, as Amina said, um, I'm Neil Forrest, and for those of you luckily enough not to know me, um, you'll get to know a bit more about me over the next hour and a bit or so. So um, I'll take you through this piece, which is called The Art of Testing Jet Engines. Um, I will say it, it was designed originally as a bit of an interactive conversation. So presenting it online, some things might seem a bit stilted, but we'll give it a go and hopefully it'll all come across all right. OK, so uh, let's get on with it. So. Um, okay, first slide, so I think uh, I'd like to let somebody else do the talking first and kind of set the scene a bit. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. So I hope everybody heard that all right, but that, as everybody knows, was John F. Kennedy, and uh, that speech was made in September 1962, which was just after I was born um, in Houston, Texas, and that was him declaring that he would set the challenge of getting America to the moon within the decade. Um, but the bit in his speech that I really like is that, that they were going to rise to this challenge, not because it was easy, but because it was hard. And as it said, that was a goal that would serve to organise and measure the best of our energies and skills. Um, and testing jet engines or developing test and testing jet engines is a bit like that as well. They are incredibly complex products. They are safety critical and a lot of people don't realise the complexity that goes into them. We take it for granted. We work in this every day, day in, day out. And, and you become a bit blasé about how much technology is in there. So. When Kennedy said he was going to go to the moon, um, you had to do a few things to make sure it would work. And the first thing is some tests. Now, this is one of my, my favourite signs. This used to be on the wall of a, a friend of mine called Larry Nightingale in Indianapolis. And, and he had this stuck in the wall behind his head on his desk. And as it says, one test is worth a thousand expert opinions. And if you're going to go to the moon, you need a test facility. Um, so what was the first thing the Americans did after Kennedy announced that he was setting that goal? Well, they, they, they went and grabbed a piece of land 
a large piece of land, 125,000 acres to be precise, um, at the border of Mississippi and Louisiana, and built um, the John C. Senna Space Centre. So it's it's there beside Lake Pontchartrain, that's New Orleans, and this in here is the John C. Senna Space Centre. And what did they do? They went about it spectacularly. So they built three test stands, the largest of which is the one you see furthest away there. That's an 18 storey high test stand that could test a full Saturn V stage one cluster, something like 13 million pounds of thrust. They cleared five towns through compulsory purchase. They set up a five mile diameter working site and then a five mile radius buffer noise zone beyond that. So the noise they make and whatever they do on site is completely hidden from public. The only thing you can see as you drive down I-5 between uh, New Orleans and heading towards um, Florida and the Gulf Coast is as you come over a bridge on, on the river as you can just see the top of the stand, the big stand over the top of the trees. Um, now every rocket that has ever taken man into space gets tested there and short clip just so you see what it's like. Um, this is a space shuttle main engine, so it's about 150,000 pounds of thrust. So, so think of two to three trents. And when they test that, they dump about a 25 meter swimming pool's worth of water down that ramp every second to stop the, the hot gases eroding away the bottom of the test stand. So it's an incredible sight to see. But that was the length they went to to get testing done to go to the moon. So jet engine testing is all subtly different. Um, rocket testing, very short. An endurance test in a rocket engine is nine minutes, which is a, a, a double fire, as they call it. Whereas jet engines have got to undergo a lot more testing than that before you can put them into service. So what's testing all about? Well, you can see I, I do like Dilbert cartoons, so use a bit of humour in there. And that was that was one of my favourite Dilberts um, from, I guess, 10 years ago or so. But it's all about data. Everything you do in testing is all about getting data. And it's from running the engine, it's from measuring things on build, it's from observing things on strip. And all of that goes towards providing the evidence to show that the product you've got is good. And that's why you test. So what are the challenges of, of testing a jet engine? So what I'll do is, is I've kind of got three groups of stuff. First one will be the challenges. We'll show the challenges and we'll go through a few of them with a few illustrated examples. So there's a lot of pictures in this and a few videos um, and hopefully it works all right in this format. So the first thing is, is you need a set of capable test facilities and we'll touch on the variation and the, the huge barrier to entry just having those test facilities as to this. Um, the environment at the, the measurement point in the engine is a pretty big challenge. You'll see that the, the pressures, the temperatures, the, the vibratory forces and things are not easy to deal with. And you can't just walk down to your local RS supplies or whatever and, and buy a thermocouple and hope to be able to measure what's going on inside the engine. It takes a lot more than that to do it. Um, your actual environment for, for leading the instrumentation out and getting the signal conditioned um, is difficult and as volume goes up that becomes more and more challenging as well and the sheer volume of instrumentation can start to if you're not careful interfere with with the result you're trying to measure so there's a very careful balance that you've got to have there um, there's a very large volume of data to be recorded now we'll touch on the different kinds of ways that data is recorded but we're now up to the point where you're recording, you know, lots of gigabytes or even into terabytes in a second now with some of the tests and not even the best volatile memory can uh, download that and deal with it in time. We'll touch on some of that. Um, the measurement uncertainty is exceptionally difficult. If you're selling jet engines and you're, you're doing guarantees at 0.1%, specific fuel consumption, you've got to have your uncertainty down to that 0.1% or, or you don't know what you might be giving away. So you've got to get that right. Um, 
real-time data analysis for safety monitoring. We, we talk about data latency times of five milliseconds where you take data off a strain gauge, start processing it and get it into a, a format that you can present to somebody to view or a computer to, to make decisions on. And you want all of that done in the decision to be made within fractions of a second. Um, and that is not an easy thing to do. Um, it also means that, that your IT that you use can't be left to chance. You can't suddenly have uh, somebody send an update to your uh, anti-spam software or whatever at the same time as you're trying to real-time measure something like that and uh, analyse the data. And then last but not least, how you store the data, transport it and the ease with which you can access it globally. Um, there are, in some of the things we do, only a few experts worldwide in the topic and transporting the data is actually more difficult these days than it is to allow the expert to interrogate the data where it sits and, and simply look at the post-processed files and the post-processed data. So they're kind of the, the key challenges. Um, and bottom line is, is it's all about getting that maximum value from data in a very short time. And we'll talk about short, medium, long-term use of data and what you get from it as well. So the first thing is, is having a set of capable rigging engine test facilities. Now, this is just a, a picture of a few of the, the capabilities within Rolls-Royce's portfolio, um, all of which I've been involved in down the years. Um, so you have everything from natural icing condition testing top left to crosswind testing outdoors with a, a, a crosswind blower um, there on the right. You know, we can make weather, we can make wind, we can make rain, we can make hail as well if we want to um, and do all sorts of things. Um, bottom left there is, is the compressor and noise test facility at Anacom. You've got the power gearbox for ultra fan in the middle and you've got 57 and 58 bed and derby there on the right. So the bottom line is, is that, that Rolls-Royce has something like 60 significant engine test facilities spread across 10 sites to deal with its full portfolio of gas turbines. And 40 of those, you know, roughly two thirds are there for development work and the remainder are for production or overhaul. Um, you have about 75 major development and R&T rig test facilities across multiple sites as well. Um, the picture's just there in the, the middle on the left is MTOC at Dalovitz and top right is the, uh, the big vacuum chamber for doing fan blade off testing. We also have access to something like 220 test assets through a third party network in conjunction with internal. And most of these are flexible in engine type and functionality. So you can see that there's a huge amount of investment in these and, and the degree of difficulty on them is high and they are unique. They are custom designed in most cases to a set of requirements. So the likes of the Anacom facility and, and the Ultrafan, there is nothing else the same as it anywhere in the world. They are truly one-offs. So that that's the first thing you've got to have. A few examples. That's your standard workhorse now for, for big engines, a 14 meter section, <coughs> excuse me, indoor test bed. Um, you can get a feel for the size of it there with the team. That's the first engine being installed in 58 bed in Derby when it was built, but that that's kind of become the de facto norm. Um, a stat I like for scientists is that there are fewer 12 by 12 meter or bigger test beds in the world than there are um, particle accelerators. So there you go. That just shows how unusual it is. And it's not the simplest thing in the world to do. Great combination of civil engineering, aero, noise suppression, and all the services and stuff. And if you think about those ones in Derby, we're in the middle of a built up area and you want to be able to run these engines 24 seven and not upset the neighbors by making noise. So difficult task. Um, right. Um, next generation, which is being built at the moment and will be open early next year, is, is one even bigger facility. 
Um, and that's the 80 bed, which I'm sure those of you that are in and around Derby will have seen going up over the last 18 months. Now, I'm not going to rattle through all the, the detail there, but just to say, you know, it, it's a huge undertaking, you know, 130 metres long, for nearly 40 metres high at the highest point, some very thick concrete to allow us to do x-ray testing inside. I shouldn't be talking us anymore, should I? But to allow Rolls-Royce to do it. Um, and there's no hard contact between the inner and outer shells, which means you don't get any ground-borne vibration being transmitted as well. You know, huge amounts of concrete and rebar, and, and it's just not normal concrete either. It's, it's mixed to have very high strength, and we add a lot more rebar in it where you need to cope with things like fan blade off capability. So the biggest thing, though, is, is that whilst you're still pulling something like three or four tonnes of air a second through the test bed, and you've got 140 plus decibel source noise in the middle, it's got to be inaudible outside. And that means, you know, less than 77 decibels at 600 metres away. So it's, it's an incredible feat. And of course, you've got to design all that before you commit to pouring the concrete. So the work that was done um, two years ago, around this time two years ago, was what set the planning permission and what gets built into the bed. And the first time you run an engine, you better hope you're modelling and your model testing was good and that, that you get the result that you want. So that's the new 80 bed that's going up in Derby. Um, now let's let's go to Stennis. So where Kennedy had all the rocket stands built, Rolls Royce is now resident and we have two stands there. Um, there is, if you like, outdoor capability with a noise arena and the ability to do crosswind and another bed that, that can do crosswind testing and endurance as well. And of course, we're committed to doing outdoor testing, but community noise problems have precluded us from doing it anywhere in this country or Europe, really. And uh, going and uh, taking rent of some space at, at Stennis is great. And uh, we're, a, we're a valued, a Rolls Royce is a valued uh, tenant on the site and does the engine testing, which NASA find utterly fascinating, to be honest. So much to my surprise, but it's good. Right, so the next thing, the challenge of the engine environment, what, what's that like? What have you got to cope with? Now, th this is a bit of an old picture, but it just kind of gives you a feel for what you're trying to cope with. You know, you've got 100,000 Gs of, of potential CF rotating load on, on some of the components. They're all kind of tip speed dominated. You've got an undercowl environment of about 350 degrees. So anything you lead out of the core as an absolute minimum and in terms of electronics has got to cope with that. Your HP compressor delivery temperatures are up around, you know, 650K. And these days with big modern cycle engines over 50 bar, um, very high metal temperatures on the, the turbines, so very difficult to put anything on there. High gas temperatures going out of the combustor into the turbines and you know, something like three or four inches per second or 40 Gs peak vibration is not uncommon on development engines and all the measurement capability you put in, it's got to be able to cope with that. Not only that, it's got to be very accurate as well. So we go to, to great lengths. Um, so there's plat rhodium thermocouples and keel heads that, that if you like condition the air that goes around there to get accurate measurements. And we can do about plus or minus 10 degrees at, at 1500. Similarly, we can use capacitance probes to, to measure tip clearances and blades up to about 1300 degrees C. And at five millimeter, up to five millimeters, you can do about plus or minus 6%. Um, that drops as you come away from that, but the temperature capability drops on that as you as you get to bigger bigger gaps. Maybe not accurate and as we would like it, but but still quite incredible me measurement capability. So the data volumes and challenges. So once you've got a sensor in there, you need to get a signal off it and take a reading and, and make some sense of it. So so what do we do? We do four ways of recording data, really. 
The first one we call steady state, where you sample over, say, a 30 second period and then time average what you've got. And the engine sits at a, a steady state condition at that. That that's maybe thousands of parameters. You sample at maybe max 200 hertz over a 30 second period, and your file size is is pretty small, a couple of megabytes for a, a file like that. We then do transient recording. So if you make the engine do maneuvers, we can record continuously, and you record tens, if not maybe low hundreds of parameters at anything up to about 500 hertz, and that can be for for minutes or hours, and those file sizes suddenly start jacking up, and you're you're in hundreds of megabytes of those. Um, today's data speeds and things, you you can visualize that and look at it real time. Um, the next one is then dynamic, and dynamic is then when you want to start sampling um, strain or um, accelerometers or something like that, probably for, for minutes at a time, certainly no more than an hour, maybe 20, 30 minutes max. There we, we're looking at hundreds of parameters and you, you're sampling them at two, three, four, five times the frequencies you're trying to detect. So anything up to about 100 kilohertz and it's 16 or 24 bit data as well. And your file sizes there are, are another order of magnitude up even although they, they could be for much less time. And then the ultimate data that we record is, is high speed digital photography now. Um, and one of the biggest and best changes we, we got in testing was moving from old analog acetate film to digital imaging. And Rolls Royce has the most incredible digital imaging department that can perform miracles. So Steve Smith and his team do great stuff. Um, but we're talking about 20 to 40 cameras, 10,000 frames a second over a fraction of a second. You, you, you've got to synchronise the cameras with the events, you know, if you're doing a, a bird ingestion test or a fan blade off. And, and you're into terabyte files and fractions of a second with volatile memory. And you're then maybe waiting for 15, 20, 30 minutes for that to download and know that you've definitely got the data in the bag. Um, and as it says, quite often even dynamic data needs reduced and presented in a frequency format for safety monitoring within a fraction of a second from acquisition. You can't do everything. You can't do broadband stuff at like that. You've got to pick the critical things you want to look for and, and kind of filter them out to do it at that range. Measurement uncertainty. So we'll, we'll kind of change the tone here. Um, <laughs> One of my colleagues used this this description. And I thought it was absolutely brilliant. That um, engine OEMs sell performance, and and the financial penalties they often guarantee are high. So if you miss the guarantees, it's expensive. So so uncertainty on performance measurement can cost you a lot of money, lot of lot of money. Um, and getting that uncertainty right is hugely important. So the biggest contributor to performance is, is the fan and the fan thermal efficiency. And to measure that, you've got to very accurately measure the temperature rise across the fan and the pressure rise. So we go to great lengths of being able to get that and we can measure it a tenth of a degree for fan bypass temperature um, and pressures very accurately. Thrust, you've got to get right down um, the uncertainty in that and put a lot of controls in temperature compensation, no zero points in the running range, um, calibrations, thrust zeros, thrust audits on a regular basis. But something like 60 pounds at 150,000 pounds of thrust is, is where, where we need to be for, for the commercial requirements. And that was likened to knowing if you stepped on a set of scales that you'd eaten the last jelly baby in the bag or not in what is essentially a gale force wind. You know, that, that's no mean feat at all. And yet you got to think that's 35 tons of engine and slave equipment hanging off the test belt bed roof that you're trying to measure that on. Fuel mass flow is similar, 0.1%. And every one of these measurements to get them that accurate needs something like 50 p 
pieces of coordinated data on calibration and all the rest of it fed through a business system to get the data at that sort of uncertainty level. It's not just simple thermocouple, connect it up, see what it says on the screen. There's a huge amount of effort goes into getting that. OK, and I'm not going to read through this, but just to show the kind of lens that we go to to get accurate temperature readings, you know, um, we've done research programmes at university technology centres to be able to determine recovery factors on, on thermocouples to get correct measurements and know that, that when we say it's 10 degrees, it's, it's 10 degrees. Um, very important for certification work. And again, that, that accuracy doesn't come for free. So just work like that becomes part of the day to day in the, the world of test and measurement. Moving up to the whole system level, um, this is a, a chart that I've used time and time again. And I always thank my opposite number at National Instruments who, who put this chart together many years ago and they use it in a, a paper that you can find on the internet called the Analog Big Data System. And what they talk about is you start with the sensors and your actuators, you know, the, taking data isn't just recording that data, but it's it's control system parameters as well. And you've got to signal condition that data and you've then got to have some software that that analyzes it and, and does what you need with it. So you really want to have freedom to pick the sensors you need for the environment you're in. You then want to be able to condition it. You want to have some software you can analyze it with and you want to be able to at some point in time put it into your IT system and tag it with enough capability and data to know you can find it for different uses in the future. You know, data from a fan blade off test is, is needed for cert, but God forbid that there's an event in service 10 years down the line, you want to be able to go back in and find that original data to, to analyze it. So the chart talks about not just the measurement chain, but what do you want out of the data real time you know when it's in motion that this is say derived parameters as you as you're running early life you've just stopped the test um you you want the performance engineer to quickly interrogate it make a decision and and, and do some different running you, you then might dump it into a repository somewhere and let some other engineers loose on the data or you want to compare it with another suite say it's a production pass off test you want to look at family where does it sit what's the statistics like and then you want to be able to archive it at some point but find it so you've then got your 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 analyze how you present and visualize the data and and how you then have the the uptime in the system and stuff is all really critical and these days the combined measurement system and the link to the IT system at what they call the edge is absolutely critical. And I think going forwards, one of the things is, is that edge needs to be a bit more blurred. Um, you don't want to let all the things like um, antivirus software get automatically run on real time systems because it, it could just bring the whole thing crashing down. On the other hand, you've got to protect that bit of the system from what goes on there and somebody injecting something nasty. So it's a bit of a dichotomy, but um, very important to consider when you, you're putting the whole system and how you measure things together. Right, so that, that's the first block. The second block then is, is, is what's driven change through time. Now, I will say I do love this picture on the right here. Um, it's a very early um, fan blade off test being done on RB211, so it'll be late 60s. Um, and the one thing that I think stands out for me is the garden shed on wheels here that has a load of instrumentation and uh, cameras in it to, to film and look at the event and record noise and stuff. You know, and you can see the OGVs and the fan disc there and they're about to put the blades in it and get on with it and it's got trip wires, but you, you can see the health and safety. It's a bunch of sandbags and, and lights and, you know, here's the crew here standing having a smoke break and all the rest of it. Wouldn't happen today, but so this bit will be an illustration of what happened then, what happens now and what's driven that change. 
So first thing is regulations. Regulations move on, but in some cases they don't. Um, and tests that were designed for 50s technology applied to 2020s engines um, does not work. Let's put it that way and no longer represents how engines are operated in service and cause problems. So we'll touch on a few regulatory changes. Commercial demands are, are definitely very different. It used to be once upon a time much more about develop an engine, stick it on as many different airframes as possible and compromise. Now the demands are so um, exacting, shall we say, that you've got to custom design an engine to, to fit on a, an aircraft. Very much a move from testing as a demonstration of capability rather than an experiment. You, you don't want to go and run something like a fan blade off and hope it works. You, you want to go and run a fan blade off test. I know it will work. Um, a very subtle but important difference. Analytical capability has definitely led to a reduction in number of, of rig tests, but as I'll show later on, it, it hasn't led to a reduction really in engine testing or um, the amount of parameters that we fit on engines to record data. Excuse me, just getting around. OK, next one is, is safety environmental protection. Um, you can't have um, your assets or, or your workforce put at risk in any way. So a whole load of things have changed around health and safety, all for the better, I, I will add. And you'll see some of that in some of the pictures that we show. Thirst for more, sorry, thirst for more and more data to compare to analyses. And that's all been enabled by the digitization and miniaturization of data acquisition. We've touched on that mainly, but I'll, I'll show you one other set of pictures that, that illustrate that point even better. Improved management uncertainty we've kind of touched on. Um, and the other thing is just sheer scale. So why have we got 14 metre test beds? Well, we've got engines that, that move, you know, a squash coat worth of air in a second. They didn't used to do that. A, a test bed is an air moving device and everything's got to be bigger because of that. So that that's driven huge changes. And the bigger it becomes, it, it, complexity goes up almost as a an exponential with size. So the, the kind of tests that we do, I'm, I'm not going to read through that list, just point out regulations associated with um, the red ones. You know, there's really 16 key tests that, that get um, regulated, if you like. Um, and the rules for these and what is pertinent and gives you a true impression of what happens in service it is very interesting as time goes on. So if you take the 150 hour type approval test, the, the, the 150 hour endurance test, it's not really an endurance test at all. It's a, it's a datum severity test. It's a benchmark severity measure. And it really bears no relation to how the engines operated in service now. It was in the 40s and 50s but it's not anymore. Um, and the fact that the rules haven't changed on that through the years um, has been a great hindrance. Now that's changing that rule. Um, I co-chaired the party that came up with a proposal and FAA have finally, after three years, kicked off rulemaking again on that. So that will change and that will, will be helpful. The next example I've picked is vibration testing. Huge amount has been done on um, changing the rules through the years on demonstrating that you won't have an aerofoil or other component fail under HCF. Um, it's not that everybody's perfect in this, there are still escapes. So, so that's a rule that, that has a lot of work done to it and gets updated relatively frequently. We'll touch on new capabilities like blade tip timing versus strain gauge where your, your means of, of meeting that test have been changed by new measurement technology. Um, ice forming conditions, um, worth pointing out, as flying has taken place in different parts of the world and flying becomes more and more frequent, the exposure to different icing threats has come up and, and understanding environmental threats has become a very big part of, of what we need to do. So icing test rules 
do get changed on a, a regular basis and what we've got to design for as a threat changes quite regularly and interestingly icing is one of those that that causes all the OEMs some form of grief it's quite unpredictable in terms of the damage that can be done if you get a nice shed and it, it's one that's very difficult to get to grips with and these days the rules have been changed to the point that it's it's beholden on the manufacturer to actually do a critical point analysis and tell the authorities what it thinks is the test condition that gives it the worst threat for icing. So that's something that would never have been dreamt of 15, 20 years ago. Last but not least, I'll pick on um, the IMI test or ASME as it's called in the military world, which is really about cyclic endurance testing. And that's the test that should really give you a feel for how long the engine will last on the wing. Um, and getting a really good understanding of how the engine operates is paramount to being able to do that test in a way that's representative. So the, the, the test requirements relatively stable, but our understanding of, of in-service operation has changed as aircraft have, have changed in their operation and the way some of the aircraft rules have changed. So interestingly, again, you can do lots of cyclic testing, but if it's not the right representation of what happens in service, it doesn't tell you where you're going to be. So just four examples from a, a long list of, of where the regulations changing or not, or the operation changing can help or hinder you getting to the right point. Right, some pictures, few words. So that is the first engine I ever worked on when I joined Rolls-Royce, it wasn't in the 60s, it was 1986. And that is um, a Phantom Spaymark 202. So that is an, after, an engine in full afterburn. You can't quite see it in the picture, but that engine has a blue streak with sonic shocks in it coming out the back, obscuring the, uh, the corrugated lean-to that was on the side of the nine bed at Hucknall. But that is seven bed at Hucknall, and that's how we used to do indoor-outdoor thrust cows. Now, for a bit of data, it's 20,500 pounds of thrust, 3,600 gallons per hour fuel flow. So that's that's more than a Trent 895 on full tilt. And that engine's sitting outdoor and it's generating just short of 150 decibels at two metres. You know, nothing around it. Um, inlet isolated against the concrete block so it doesn't affect the thrust reading with a flexible inlet. And... You know, just minimum set up and away you go. And you'd have to sit and wait for days or weeks for, for the right weather to be able to do a test like that. Modern equivalent, that is a 54 bed. That's a Trent 900 doing an indoor first principles test for thrust calibration. And now we can set it up in the indoor bed. You're pretty immune to the weather. And this boom here traverses up and down the bed when the engine's running and you record the airflow through the bed and then know what your buoyancy effect is and what your, your drag is on the static parts of the thrust frame. And you can calibrate the real thrust of the engine by analysis from recording that data. Um, interestingly, 70 odd thousand pounds of thrust, less fuel flow and it's indoors. The bed absorbs most of the noise so you, you don't hear much 200 metres down the road, really. So that's the kind of changes that have happened from test bed capability point of view. Digital data we talked about. Um, late 90s, we introduced what was called rationalised automated measuring system, RAMS. So if anybody's on the, the line from MDS, they, they know what it's all about, what, what was done. Um, and that was the real sea change. Before that, we had a set of transient and dynamic capabilities and we called them caravans, but basically boxes on wheels. And you can connect a max of three of them, I think, up to one test bed at one time. So you could get three times 96 parameters off an engine. That was it. That was all you could do. And we put this capability in and suddenly you could do 3000 parameters on, on, on each bed. Um, there was a limited amount of stand scans that you could have 
transients went straight on to paper plots and, and people then had rolls of paper that they had on drawing boards that they could move and, and measure the data by hand off these paper plots. And all your dynamics and noise had to go to magnetic tape and be post-processed. And, and the life of these tapes wasn't good and they took a lot of looking after. And when it was put in, there was this uh, huge increase in data volume capability. Suddenly, each facility could record double the whole site capacity overnight. And it was something like a two orders of magnitude increase in, in that capacity. And it was estimated at the time, the first three years of running we did with digital data recording, grabbed more data than all the accumulated data to date, because it's not just the data that you look at, it, it's all the data that you take and do things to, to get to what you need to look at. So it was something like three and a half gigabytes of data in three hours, which just was, was mind boggling in the late 90s. And, and it might be worth reminding people that, that a gigabyte disk in a computer did not exist until probably about 2005. Um, so the network just couldn't take the data and then uh, we were accused of building a four lane motorway in the test bed with only one junction to get data in and out. Um, uh, we actually couldn't run the bed for another three days as we got the data off the, the real time system computer. We, we did get a tape drive at the time, which was about half a terabyte and that cost something like three quarters of a million quid. So. But that was the start of it all. That was the, the big sea change, the, the thing that changed it all. Right, let's talk uh, flight testing. So that, um, if it was interactive, I would say to you, what is it? So, it's an Avro Lincoln with a time turboprop stuck on the front. Um, and that was one of our flight test capabilities that we used to operate out of the, the hangar at Hucknall. And that's a picture of it in the hangar, ready to do an icing test. So you'd put this spray grid on the front on this scaffolding. You'd go and find icing conditions by flying around the, the east coast of England and out over the North Sea. And when you found them, you'd spray the water through the grid that would ice up the front of the engine. You can just imagine uh, how safe that is and uh, why airframers don't like doing that kind of testing today because once you find the icing conditions, you're putting all your other engines at threat as well. So it then moved on that, that you got ground simulated altitude testing. Um, that picture, you can tell by the, the cold nozzle is a Trent thousand of some variety in the ground based simulated altitude test cell at Arnold Engineering, which is Tennessee in the US. Now you can do full icing testing in there. You can close couple it, you can put icing in. You have the windows, which is great on the inlet and you can film the ice shedding as you, as you do the maneuvers, let the ice build, accelerate the engine, let the ice shed. The big downside of that is, is it's a unique facility. There is only one in the world that, that is trustworthy. The Russians have one, probably not quite as big and we certainly wouldn't use it. So this is the only one in the world. But it's not exactly environmental friendly because it, it's over $100,000 per hour in energy cost to generate that cold air. Um, and the plant reliability isn't as good as it needs to be. So you then move on to, well, how do you do the testing in a, in a better way? Um, and Rolls-Royce and Pratt and & Whitney did this joint venture, which is operated by MDS and was, was built by MDS in a place called Thompson, Manitoba, which takes advantage of natural cold weather to do the icing testing. So um, if you look at the top left picture, you can see the engines mounted under the, the blue stand where the white box is towards the right of it. And you've got this great big long inlet and where that ladder looking structure is at the front, that's where there's a water spray grid and, and you spray warm water into the front of that inlet. And as the air accelerates, immediately that water comes out of the nozzles, it, it turns to ice and the ice hits the front of the engine. Now, th this really is the middle of nowhere in Canada um, and, and it's worth pointing out why. Um, not as far north as, as you might expect, um, for those of you that, that know the longitude and latitude will realise it's about the same level up the, 
the world is Glasgow and Edinburgh are. It's pretty well the closest cities that we would calibrate. Yet in winter, the average day temperature is is horrendously cold. You know, that's a plus or minus one standard deviation chart there. But why did we go there? Because one, it had the climate. Two, it has some infrastructure despite being in the middle of nowhere. And there are logistics. There is a, a road goes that far. And the reason the road goes that far is that there's a bunch of nickel mines there. So Thompson was named after Lord Thompson of um, the International Nickel Company, which a lot of you in the, the line might recognise. And that that's why it's there. The US auto companies rock up there every winter and do all their cold weather testing. So there are some little workshops that can do bits and pieces around as well. So it's a, an absolutely fascinating place to be. But that lets you generate the icing testing without having to pay $100,000 plus per hour um, for generating cold air. Right, noise testing, we're, we're back to, I think, space again. So this is how noise testing used to get done at Hucknall. And you can see the wooden stakes and the grass and the man with the microphone in the stand. And he basically, the engine would sit at a condition and he would move the microphone around and somebody would tell him through his earphones when to move the microphone. Um, so it's a spay and you, you can see it looks very safe, doesn't it? We No way would we contemplate doing that today. Noise equipment, how's that changed? Um, you know, originally, even when we got slightly better than that, we got up to, I think, 14 microphones. You can see there's 14 gauges on there that just tell you you're recording. Everything needed to be post-processed back then in the 70s. And then um, the new facility at Stennis, um, we can measure a lot more um, parameters. We have something like 300 acoustic sensors now for a, a noise test and a new engine type. Um, the interesting thing is, is the sheer volume of sound that you can record and that we've got, a, you know, what is it, one, two, three, four, five orders of magnitude upturn from lowest to highest pressure field, 46 to 146 decibels, and everything is time stamped. And we sample at 65 kilohertz to, to look at the audio range all the way up. So quite an incredible capability. And what does that look like? That is the noise stand now at, at Stennis. That is a turbulence control screen or golf ball, as it's called, to, to condition the, the incoming air, take the turbulence out of it and stop it affecting the fan noise. And that is the arena with all the, the microphones laid out on them. They're the little black dots that you can see. Um, you can see that big test stand there, which is about a mile and a half away. And a couple of interesting features here, but one of them is, is these concrete slabs you see just at the side of the bed. They are um, pointing upwards at about 15 degrees. So all the noise from the, the engine, instead of reflecting off the buildings and spoiling the noise signature, just get bounced back up over the field of the microphones in the test bed um, and don't disturb it. That was a, a real interesting bit of getting that bed built. Interesting thing though is, is that wildlife can and has delayed their noise testing out there. So one extreme to the other, it used to be wind that stopped us at Hucknall and just uh, give you a feel for this, the kind of noise you get just from birds and insects that you pick up. And the thing is, is Stennis is so far out in the middle of nowhere and has that noise buffer that actually these noises become important. And it's it's an interesting analogy with what's going on with, with COVID and the, the lockdown and the lack of activity where a lot of people are saying, well, oh, aren't the birds louder and the insects louder? Just with no other background noise, you hear them more, they stick out. Just thought that was worth mentioning. The things you have to overcome. Right. Right. Um, and then last but not least, we'll touch on, on blade off testing. So original blade off testing was all pretty hairy stuff. Um, that's back to Spay Avon territory in, in, in the 60s and early 211 tests as well in some of these pictures. And again, it was it was an outdoor bed with, with sandbags and who knew what was really going to happen? It was it was all 
pretty seat of the pants stuff. Um, and these days, it's a whole different world. So before you commit to doing a fan blade off test these days, failing one is so sheer price sensitive that you've got to get it right. And before we would conduct a test like that, you do a whole load of preliminary rig tests. So you might look at the release blade blow off. You, you, you show that um, when you let the explosive charge off that the blade doesn't get given extra speed it shouldn't have. You do that on a bench. You do trailing blade integrity. You just look at when the blade releases, what happens to the blade next to it. Um, we do a single arm release blade integrity. You spin the blade up to, to speed and show it doesn't doesn't come off when you've designed the weak point into it. You then do fan case containment and a full carcass rig for containment, fuse operation and vibration afterwards. And all of these bar the first one need a big vacuum chamber to do it. So that picture on the right is, is a Rolls Royce facility in Dalov. It's called the, the Large and Specialist Spin Facility. And that is a, a huge vacuum chamber that you can basically take down to a, a, as near perfect a, a vacuum as you, you've got. And at 3000 horsepower, it'll quite easily drive the biggest fans that we have to full speed, no problem. And we can do those kind of tests. So lots of lights, LED lights have helped a lot with that capability, less heat generation. And of course, in a vacuum, you've got nothing to take heat away. So that's helped with cameras and lighting substantially as well. So move on to the setup. So that is um, a Dalovitz rear mounted fuselage type engine ready for a test. Um, you can see that the engine's mounted and you try to simulate the stiffness of the, the back of the airframe. And in this case, not only does it have that mount, but it has a counterweight to simulate the engine on the other side. Um, you can see that the release blade gets painted in colour, so you know which one it is, you know what to look for. And there's lots of painting and markings put on the external so that it can analyse the high speed photography at a later date and look at the movements and stuff. Don't leave it to chance for a radio signal to trigger the blade detonation. So we end up with a, a torque tube and a split ring that needs a very high voltage signal to, to fire the detonator. And off we go. Right, so I have a little bit of film. Apologies to some of my colleagues who might be on the line who, who appear in this, but a few years ago, um, Discovery Channel did a programme about the A380. Um, and as part of that, they came and uh, spent some time at Rolls Royce and uh, it was Trent 900 at the time. So the Trent 900 fan blade, there is a clip on YouTube that you can go and find um, that is out of that programme that you can see. So Hillary's on. You're about to be a superstar, Hillary, yet again. So is Eric Johnston. High speed film cameras are used to analyse the action. And at last, the throttles are opened and the engine brought to its full awesome power. This is what it feels like to be inside a building 200 yards away from a nine million pound blade off event. Blade off testing is normally top secret, but for the first time, Rolls Royce have released this footage. Although the engine was totally destroyed, the fan case did its job and no large lumps of metal were ejected. So I don't, I don't know if you caught what uh, a late friend and colleague Ian Child said at the end there, but it was that was an expensive five minutes. So 
So that's one heart stopping moment, but but this is the real proof in the pudding, um, which is flight test. And if you're in a, an engineering position, a project, and you go fly for the first time. This is the one that's that's the real heart stopping moment. And this is, I guess, the earliest and the latest three shaft derivative um, test being done on the original 211 test bed and the 747. And it's it's an incredible feeling when you've you've done something like that and you go fly for the first time. So I don't know if any of you have seen the old VC10 clip before where the two Conways were removed and the RB211 was stuck on the back, but that was it was flight tested. Right. So I guess I've got about five minutes left. We'll quickly go through challenges and opportunities and leave it open to to questions. So um what are the challenges and opportunities going forwards? The big thing is the, the optimised use of analysis and test. Um, we, we've got to do what's best there. Um, there's new engine technology that needs new measurement capability. You can't go and measure strain on the surface of a, a composite fan blade in the same way as you can a, a homogeneous structure like a titanium fan blade. There's new features that need test facilities. We've built a, a PGB facility for the ultra fan gearbox um, that's unique the only one of its type in the world um, using analytical tools to better design and understand test facilities um, cfd for for test bed aero and aero acoustics are tools that we now use to know that the beds will work first time um, and you've got digital architectures for automation and a flexible and scalable digital data acquisition system um, and roles that's been entitled TEDS, which is the, the test execution and data system, and it's it's real time. And that's on that um, PGB facility and on ATBED. And then really it's big data. How do you make much better use of the data for the long term? How do you tag it better uh, and make sure anybody that wants to find it at some point in the future can and knows what's in there? And then last but not least, it's all about people and, and I'll touch that as the last slide. So interestingly, um, if, if you look at that, that is three generations of a very similar engine. Um, and you can see through time with grey, blue, red being as you progress, how many more parameters the same engine test has had fitted to it through time. And that is despite claims that testing becomes cheaper and easier, the better your analytical capability becomes. It doesn't work that way. The more analysis that gets done, the more margin can be taken out of the design, the more data you need to know that you've not exceeded the capability somewhere. And if you just look at the physical manifestation of that, that is the three generations apart, the first and third generation. And you can see all these wires here represent the volume of instrumentation fitted to that one and that one and doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out the difference. Um, what's it really all about? It's really all about getting the triangulation of these three things right. Your modelling and analysis has got to be right, you know, knowing your boundary conditions, getting the right assumptions. Tied with the uncertainty, your variability and your testing capability to bring it all together and know that that you can one analyze best and two match the test and the analysis with your uncertainty being the thing that bound you all together there is very definitely a sweet spot in building a number of engines and rigs for a development program and the interesting way to look at it is is a kind of the cost of acquiring your data and your your vehicle complexity. So if you fit too much instrumentation, your cost of acquiring data goes up because you end up with too few tests that are too complex and one failure means you lose all of it. Um, on the other hand, if you don't fit enough instro, you just don't get enough out of the engine and you end up doing too many tests. So fi finding this sweet spot right and interestingly, probably in the 90s when we were averaging high hundreds, maybe a thousand parameters a build, that seemed to be optimum. You were getting engines back on test regularly. These really high ones mean that the engines in build too long. So 
getting back to that sweet spot is a big opportunity going forward. New technology like blade tip timing um, are incredibly important. Um, this is megahertz rate pseudo analog type capability and, and it's been used for some amazing stuff. But th this can measure the blade tip passing so accurately that you can detect whether the blade is going a torsion mode, a, a flat mode, a, you know, <coughs> excuse me, a wh whatever mode, um, by analysing the passing timing of, of each of the blades through a series of tips around a, a circumference. Um, and the amount of work that, that the guys have put into coming up with a proprietary system for that, you know, and the sheer amount of data that was used. So um, when Rose was investigating the IP compressor problems, there was something like over 100 terabytes of raw data processed to get to a critical understanding of what was going on. And that was something like 10 EDPs worth of data processing that was conducted in about a six month period. So it says 50 billion blade passing events on a on a test. So worth pointing out. Um, power gearbox facility, um, an attitude rig, a power rig and a, a, a custom building, you know, huge investments to be able to get into the next generation of engines. Um, just as expensive as a as a big 14 meter test bed, uh, but utterly unique capability, as I said earlier. Um, the whole thing, if you look at the power rigs mounted on about a two and a half thousand ton concrete block that's mounted on springs, that's a seismic mass. So if you get a failure, it's not going to rock the building. Very complicated, unique, huge power, huge speed. Um, test bed control and data acquisition through the years, quickly flick through those. That was the opening shot. That was Whittle with his clipboard recording off his dials. You then had manometers and uh, the guys reading off manometers again, manual recording. That is the paper plotters being uh, scrutinised by hand and measured back in the 60s for transient data. The first signs of electronics and uh, computerised stuff being, being recorded in the 70s. More of it in the 80s and the first time you see visual screens appearing. 90s, that's what the first digital data acquisition systems looked like, and that's what the second generation looked like. And and if you go on one of the big beds now, you'll recognise that it, it's still the same. Just the stuff behind it gets better and better all the time. Miniaturisation of, of measurement capability. Those three pictures have the same measurement capacity, roughly. Um, you have the old rotating scanny valves in a, in a rack. You've got a pressure brick and you've got a miniature pressure scanner that you'd use on flight tests these days, all you know, getting close to similar kind of uncertainty, but, but that makes the whole thing easier. And it also means that you can do a lot more on flight test as well, because you can you can fit these small ones on flight, whereas you can't the big ones. Probably not worth going into that in, in a whole load of detail. Um, kind of covered it earlier, but you do have to have a bunch of systems to feed this and make it all work and moving to industry standard software systems rather than custom in-house built ones has, has been a big move over the years. Um, so Verum, for instance, who do, who do a, a tool called Hypertest, white goods, medical, automotive, we can now apply that in aerospace and, and that's been a huge change that you can get at that. CFD for test facilities, just a, a look at one of the test beds being analysed and looking for problems. And when you discover things like that, you know you can make changes to avoid them. So those kind of capabilities are, are really new and difficult, but they've been brought on in leaps and bounds in the last few years. And then last but not least, really the last slide, people, you know, engineering is the ultimate team sport. and. Uh, the diversity of skills and knowledge that you need to develop a jet engine and get it to the point you can put it in service is immense. You know, a thousand plus people, 10,000 years experience, fitters, photographers, stress engineers, designers, development engineers, you name it, um, they're all needed. And, you know, they've all got to be technically competent. They've all got to be looking to, to get things done and move on. 
we've got to be confident, creative and, and optimistic, really, is the kind of characteristics you look for. So that's that's a team photo from a um, just before doing a, a recent fan blade off test. I'm hiding at the back there somewhere and I coached the team through that. Um, but it's great to be part of that. And that's what it's really all about is the people when it comes down to it at the end. So to finish off, Werner von Braun, one of my heroes, what did he say about Stennis? Well, I don't know how we're going to get to the moon, but I know we're going to have to go through Mississippi to get there. And that's where Rolls Royce is nowadays as well. Um, it shares the site with NASA and has to do some of its critical tests there to get the product done. And thank you and open to questions, I guess. Thanks, Neil. That was great. Really interesting. If anyone would like to ask a question now, please could they submit it through the uh, Q&A section as shown earlier. Uh, we've got two questions that have already been asked. So the first one is, who was the most influencing person in your career? In my career, um, some of you know I did a piece just before I, I left and I would have said two, two people. Um, one was a guy called Charles Ritchie, who was my boss when I served my apprenticeship. Um, who was an incredible guy and he was he was all about learning he was it was what have you learned today you haven't wasted the day if you haven't learned some things so i would have said him and then at rolls royce i guess it was my first chief engineer which some of you will know was a guy called dick beckett um dick was a great guy and then my first day in rolls royce i got an hour's audience with him unbeknownst to me um, and he simply asked me well you do you know what I'm paying you to do? And I said, well, engineer things. <laughs> and he said, no, he said, I'm paying you to make decisions. And uh, he said, I expect you to, when I give you a problem, to go and get to the bottom of it, come up with a proposal of how we fix it and give me your rationale as to why you think that's what we should do. So I would have said those two. I've had some great bosses down the years. I hope I've been a good boss to some people down the years, um, but I would I would say probably Charles and, and Dick are right up there. Then we've got another one saying there are more parameters on an engine, but there are fewer engines in an EDP. So have the number of parameters across the EDP as a whole dropped? No. <laughs> what I would say is the number of parameters that might get properly analysed may well have dropped. Um, the real important thing is, is are you making full use of everything that's recorded or not? And and that's a difficult thing to to judge. Um, density, it's difficult to look at. I, I would say overall, when you look at the stats, there's not much difference from one programme to the other. Um, just it seems to be there's a longer elapsed time now because the designs are so much more complex. When you find a problem, it seems to take longer to get to a solution because you've got a much tighter design envelope to get that solution in. So if anything, you end up with longer from first test to, to into service than in the past, driven by the fact that you've got way less design margin. But the amount of testing that gets done and data recorded, it's a lot more now than it certainly was pre-digital data. Um, so probably, you know, Trent 500 and 900 were the first that, that had digital data. Before that, you didn't. And there was a lot more judgment made with a lot less data. Um, so, so data being available has, to some extent, driven, I would say, poorer judgment in some way. People are so much more reliant on data and have this thirst for it because they know they can get it. Whereas decisions used to have to be made without it or with less of it. So difficult to tell, but but on balance, I would say, you know, since digital data came along, every program is getting at least the same, if not more. And 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 in a bit sense, it's more because we've gone from eight to sixteen to twenty-four to thirty-two bit data, all of which means more data recorded. And the sampling rates have gone up from 40 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz, for instance, all more data. The sheer volume just keeps going up. So. And we've got another interesting one saying, nowadays we need analysis to estimate turbine entry temperature from turbine gas temperature probes. 
When do you think we will get to a stage, if we ever do, to measure directly the turbine entry temperature? I'm thanking you for your lectures I'm, I'm going to say not in my lifetime, that's for sure. Um, I, I guess it's, it's, it's one of two or three holy grails of measurement capability in an engine. Um, and to get it to the right degree of accuracy is is incredibly difficult. Um, we've always relied on a thermodynamic calculation and test, so thermal paint mapping and observation, and 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 your your two stages of turbine back in the in the engine before you can do it. We we did a test on a 900 several years ago. Um, where we had some very expensive probes, like you know, a million pound plus worth of probes um, that that we put into, I think it was the IPNGV, so immediately behind the HP turbine, trying to look through it to get at the temperature. But um, anything that was too intrusive, too expensive. So I don't think in my lifetime we'll ever get there. Let's put it that way. And then we've got another one asking why we do a blade off test in a vacuum chamber. So the reason we do a blade off test in a vacuum chamber is, is pure practicality. Um, a fan on a Trent 1000, the rough rule of thumb, a fan for every thousand pounds of thrust needs a thousand horsepower to drive it. That's a, a fair enough first order approximation. So if you've got a 70,000 pound thrust engine, and you were driving it in air, you'd need 70,000 horsepower. Um, you run it in a vacuum, your mechanical behaviour stays the same. You, you take the aero load off it and you've got to compensate for that in the way you set up tip clearances and the axial positioning in the rig. But it means you can drive what would have been a 70,000 horsepower consuming fan in a vacuum for less than 3,000 horsepower. So it, it's just the practicality of being able to do a test. And then we've got another one asking, is there any good written source or handbook for jet engine testing? Um, so I, I authored um, a chapter in a Wiley book, which was, um, what was it called? The Encyclopedia of Aerospace Engineering. And there is a about an eight page section in there on on testing. So I know that's public domain. Um, there are other bits and pieces around. Um, a lot of it is very much proprietary and, and gained inherent knowledge from tens of years of experience on this. It's, it's one of the big barriers to entry is just that inherent knowledge of being able to know how to test. Um, there are a lot of individual test types where there are good documents. Um, AIAA standards and best practice documents exist for a lot of test types. How to do a, a first principles cross cal is one of them. How to conduct a contaminated fuel test in a fuel control system. Um, so there are some very specific good practice documents through those kind of standards authorities um, that you can pick up and look at. But overall, not I know of. And that's all the questions I think we've got. Just one more from me. Um, just a quick question to ask. Any advice you'd give to people starting their career or in an early career at Rolls-Royce or in engineering? So I'd, I'd say three things, I think. Um, one is be open minded about what you want to do where you want to get to. Put your blinkers on and say in five years I want to be in that job, in 10 years I want to be in that job. Um, you will learn things as you go along and you will you will come across things that you enjoy doing. So the most important thing is, is to be flexible to to adapt. Don't be don't be too blinkered too early. The, the second thing I I'd, I'd say is concentrate on the job you're doing. Um, Progress and a good career will depend on you delivering on the job you're in. People will assess you on, did you do a good job in what you were doing today? Um, I've seen too many people that I would say do something called grade chasing or whatever, um, where they focus on getting their next job, not doing the job they're currently in. 
So do the former rather than the latter. And then thirdly, and most importantly, get yourself a mentor. Independent from the area you're working in at the time. But get a mentor, you know, sound people out, find out who are people who are well respected. You know, a couple, three levels above you and form a mentoring relationship with somebody. Um, you need to drive it yourself. Don't wait for a mentor to, to come to you. You need to, to drive the pace of the interaction, but it will not do you any harm whatsoever. You can choose to accept or reject advice, but having a mentor is a, is a great thing to do. And just let's like say, be open minded and, and focus on delivering in the job you're in and you'll get to where you, you deserve to get to if you do all of that. I guess I used the phrase earlier as well. Reflect at the end of each day and think, what did I learn? Somebody once said to me, have you been in the same job for 10 years? In which case, do you have one year's experience 10 times or have you got 10 years of experience? Two very different things. Have you grown in the job? Have you you know, had a career? Have you, have you learned something new as time goes on, not just repeated the same stuff year after year? I think that's an important reflection to have as well. So hope that helps, Emil. Thank you.